Would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious Lord, we gather on this Monday, or Tuesday, this day of the week. Y'all are with me. We gather, O oh Lord, the rain is falling, it is the beginning of fall, and as we hear your word read, and we hear it proclaimed, may we hear your words, may they be echoed in our hearts, and may it fill them to their fullest, but may they transform our hearts so that we would leave this time together with you and with each other, not as mere hearers of your words, but as doers of your words. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So before I get started, have you ever had that moment where you took a day off and then you go back to work and your week is all messed up? <laughs> Welcome to my Monday. Yeah, I took yesterday off. But anyway, so yes, I do know today is Tuesday. Thus, I'm here for chapel. So let me tell you about me. So my daughter is, uh, she's in college. She is a, a sophomore at the University of Vermont. Uh, I have an older daughter who is a first year student in law in DC. And my daughters and I, I have, I, when they were younger, I tortured them with all of the music of the 80s. They are good 80s children. They like all the same bands I like. They like everything. So it's no doubt that now that we're in the Spotify era, they are branching out on their own. They're finding their own music. But now the fun is they're sharing it with me. And so a couple of weeks ago or months ago, Anna turns me on to a, a relatively new country music star by the name of Zach Bryan. And I like Zach Bryan. I mean, just great stuff. If you run into Red Dirt Country and all that, it's okay. Listen to his stuff anyway. There's a storyline that he tells that all of us can relate to at some form or fashion, no matter what station in life we are, no matter what side of the country we grew up on. I mean, I grew up, I'm a southerner, east coaster. He is Oklahoma, farming, oil wells, Navy, all of that. The complete opposite of my existence. And yet it resonates with me. But he had a new album that came out just a few weeks ago. And there's a song in this album called Pink Skies. And this song, Pink Skies, it traces themes of loss, of memories, of passing of time. It's sort of set around a funeral. But there's this poignant lyric in the course of the song that he repeats three times that just hits it home for me. Your funeral was beautiful. I bet God heard you coming. Ooh. Now, haunting here. Your funeral was beautiful, but I bet God heard you coming. There's a comment on a life well lived. Your funeral was beautiful. I bet God heard you coming. It's a fitting tribute. Now, just while we're keeping score here, some of you are going to go into churches. Some of you are going to go into serving in the greater scheme of Christianity. What I hope and what I told my congregation when I was talking about this song once, I said, look, there's this old joke that we preachers have, like, live your life in such a way that the preacher won't be tempted to lie. <laughs> yeah, now you got it, right? You see what I'm talking about? So that's a challenge for us, to live in such a way that there is no doubt about how we live, who we are, who we follow, and where we're going to go. As I was thinking of this song, I thought of an article written several years ago by the civil rights leader and the Baptist minister of the Georgia congressman, John Lewis. He wrote this article as he knew that he was dying. In the weeks before his death, he knew that his time was coming to an end. He had cancer. So he writes this article, sort of his final word on the matter of life. And as it was published on the day of his funeral, these are his words. In my life, I have done all that I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters. Let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. John Lewis, ever the statesman, ever the warrior for justice, ever fighting for equality and equity, ever the minister, ever the child of God, left no doubt to us that God heard him coming. So the question is, what about you and what about me? What is our work to do and how are we to do it? 
such that the end of our lives, at our funerals, that they are a celebration of life, of faithful living, leaving no doubt that God hears us coming. So our text today speaks to an issue facing early Christianity, early Christendom, sort of this, especially in Ephesus. Now what we know is that there was division. There was a division between the Gentiles and the Jews within the Christian church. Now can I give this context? The Gentiles, uh, they, the Jews thought the Gentiles should convert to Christianity by way of circumcision. The Gentiles thought they could go straight from where we were as pagans and whatnot straight to following Christ. And there's this logic behind what the Jews were thinking. I mean, Jesus was a Jew, so it makes sense that you would want to become a Jew first in order to understand Jesus and his teachings. Their logic makes sense. However, Pentecost erases all of that. When that mighty wind rushes out over the entire assemblage and they begin to hear the gospel message in all their tongues, in all the languages of the world, Think about if we took all of the international students that come here to Wake Forest and we said, we're going to gather in the chapel and we're going to pray together the Lord's Prayer and we're going to pray it in our own tongue. Now imagine how beautiful that would sound. Confusing at first, but if we know what it is that we're praying, we know what it is that we believe, it is a beautiful cacophony of the kingdom of heaven. So this author speaks to this. The author of Ephesians begins to speak to this division. He said, yes, you were separated at one time. Yes, you were Jews and Gentiles. However, strangers in the commonwealth of Israel is how he calls them. You were once far off, but you are now brought near in Christ, in his flesh, both into one, breaking down these walls of hostility, breaking down the thing that divides us. You're no longer strangers, but fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. And in verse 15, the author reminds us that Christ came abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself a new humanity in hope of thus making peace. Creating a new humanity from two into one. Now he uses the word kyrios, not nuos, this idea of a new humanity, not kyrios, but nuos, meaning a quality not of time, but of transformation. So he's not talking about new like, well, there was the old and new, like old Coke, new Coke. Those of you that are old enough remember that. Old Coke, new Coke, not that. He's talking about transformation all the way around. A whole new soft drink, if you will. This idea of transformation. So I think about this in terms of a world that is bent on division, a world that is bent on classes and division around schools and politics and nations and rules and races and all that. The gospel imperative is that we as mature adults, we as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are the trendsetters, that we are the pace setters. We're the ones, the imperative to pick up John Lewis's mantle and has challenged us and let the spirit of peace and everlasting love be our guide. Because if not us, if not you and me, if not you and me, then who's to do this? Friends, this is our work. This is our calling. And this text tells us that this new chaos, this new humanity, this transformed humanity, we recognize that we are one with God, one with each other, and in one in ministry to all the world. Now, those of you that have studied United Methodism, anybody in here United Methodist? Okay, those of you United Methodist, you know these words, one with God, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. This is part of United Methodist communion liturgy. But let me just tell you what, this is church liturgy. One with God, one with each other, and one in ministry. This is what we are about as followers of Jesus Christ. This is what we're about as budding scholars that want to be ministers and leaders in the faith community, where we are connecting individuals with God, connecting each individual with each other, and connecting ourselves to the world. This is not just about one denomination or one person's mission. This is what we are all supposed to do as children of God. And if we do this, to connecting people with God, connecting people with each other, and connecting ourselves with the world, then guess what? I bet God hears you and I coming. No doubt about it. So verse 16 and 17 talks about be reconciled to God through the cross, to death to division, proclaim peace to the far and near, Jew and Gentile, prodigal and faithful. See, what happens with this statement is that all of us have access 
to the relationship with God. So there is no longer, you've got to be first this in order to get to God. No, we can all pick up the phone and we can call right now and God will take your call and mine. So this idea of a new humanity is about a new relationship with God. What we know about the study of human history, the Bible is a story of God's never failing love, everlasting love. I like what he says in, in 130, Psalm 136, God's steadfast love endures forever. See, what happens with us in humanity, we know about the fall, we know all this. We at times have turned our back on God as a human people, as individuals. We have turned our back to God. But this idea of a new humanity, a changed relationship with God, means that we turn to God. We recognize ways God tries without fail to change us, to turn us around. I mean, think with me about the stories in the Bible that we know. We know about Adam and Eve. I mean, they had one rule. I mean, seriously, how hard is this? How hard? And yet we see what happened with humanity. One rule, turn her back to God. But yet what does God do? God tries to redeem them and bring them back in. We have Noah and the ark. And we know what happens with the story, right? I mean, you know, 40 days, the animals that go on the ark, all that kind of stuff, everything. And God wipes out, wipes his slate almost clean. And it grieves God so much, throws a rainbow up in the sky and says, I will give you hope. I'm never going to do this again, but let's start afresh. And we know we sort of screwed that up again. And of course, we do that. We have Abraham. Abraham, this faithful man, you know, an old man. I mean, we, you know, live like thousands of years old. And he says, look at the stars. You'll have descendants more than these, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And God's promise holds true, right? Abraham hangs on to like, I think you're nuts, God, but I'll hold on to this. I'll run with it. Thus, Isaac is born the name Laughter. Moses and the prophets, and we finally we get up to Jesus and see what I've learned about this is that God has no quit, right? I mean, God has no quit. God will constantly fight for us. I mean, we talk about the stories of the lost sheep, the prodigal son, the garden when Jesus is praying, Lord, let this passion reap sweats, blood. Folks, that's praying. And yet he goes to the cross. Thomas says, Lord, I'm not going to believe until you show me your wounds. And he goes, all right, Thomas, touch me right here. Feel the pain. Or Paul, who denies him. Paul, who persecutes him. Paul, who is blinded and says, Paul, when you believe, I'll open your eyes to something new. See, friends, we can run. We can run all we want from God, but what we begin to know is if we run, that we're just going to die tired, that God wins in the end. So this idea of being at one with God means that we've got to change ourselves, that what we want to do is not for ourselves, but it's to please God. It's what God wants for us. We've got to listen to God. We've got to learn from God. We've got to say things like, not my will be done, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And see, when we start to live that way, guess what? God hears us coming. But it's not just what we do, how we connect with God. It's how we connect with each other. Also in verses 14 through 16, Christ is our peace. His flesh makes us one, makes us children of God. Now think about this. Jesus pretty much has one message. I mean, I can reduce, you know, all of Matthew's work, all of Mark's work. I mean, they all copy from it. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John comes along. He basically does the same thing, just he does it in different words. Jesus' command to us is what? To love. Period. Love one another. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. What that really means is that everybody that we've named is precious in God's sight. No one is left out of this equation. There is not a soul on the face of the earth left out of God's call through Jesus for us to love. That each of us is precious in God's sight, just like you and I are. So if that's the case, then why do we end up fighting amongst ourselves? If that's the case, then why are we letting forces not of God, forces not of the one who loves us, forces not of the one who tears down walls, forces not of the one who redeems us for all eternity, for no other reason than to love us. Why do we let those forces divide us and tear us apart when the commandment is simple, to love one another? See, we are called to be better than what the world wants us to do. We're called, as we hear sometimes in the liturgy, to resist evil and injustice and oppression whatever form they say, and whatever forms they present themselves. In other words, again, those of you that are tracking United Methodism, read our baptism liturgy. Resist evil, injustice, and oppression, whatever forms they resist themselves. See, we're called to live in peace with one another. And you don't have to be 
a United Methodist enough, we know that this is a universal message for all of us. So then what does this mean? It means, friends, that there are some things that we need to stop and some things that we need to start. We need to stop gossip. We need to stop false hoods. We need to stop the tropes that aren't true. We've heard about some of those in the last couple of weeks. We need to stop labeling each other. We need to stop seeing people as anything other than children of God. And we need to stop delighting when others lose. And we need to start. We need to start caring about the well-being of others. We need to start pulling for people to do and to be their best. I'll never forget the moment years ago. I mean, years ago. I, it, you know, when I was uh, doing youth ministry and into my first uh, couple of years following youth ministry, Sunday afternoon, the way I sort of rewound and sort of bounced myself back from morning worship was I would watch NASCAR races. Now, I liked it. I don't know what it is about cars going around a circle. It probably put me to sleep. I took a nap, all this. But I followed Dale Earnhardt. I was a big number three fan. And at that time, if you remember your history, Jeff Gordon was the young gun, and you either liked Jeff Gordon or you hated Jeff Gordon. And one of the things in NASCAR at the time that seemed to be socially acceptable was you cheered to put someone in the wall to wreck them out. And I never forget, I'm sitting there going, I'm watching the race one afternoon, I'm like, put him in the wall, put him in the wall, put him in the wall. And my daughter, Clara, the older one, she's about four years old. She comes in and she goes, now mind you, she's wearing her Earnhardt hat that I've gotten her, proud of her, right? She goes, Daddy, aren't we supposed to pull for everyone to win? Yeah, okay. So we need to start pulling for everyone to win, for everyone to be their best. We need to start looking beyond our needs to the needs of others. And we need to start helping one another. I don't care if it's not your job. Help one another. I mean, we talk about this all the time in my shop when we talk about employees. Like, if I see one of my maintenance teams struggling to move a set of tables, I can walk down the hall and act like I don't see things. That does not build good teamwork, by the way. If I see someone struggling, if I'm not physically able to do it, my job is to say, take a break for a second. Let me go find somebody that will help you. But if I can do it, I need to start helping one another. But that's just simple stuff. But it goes up from there. And when we make a difference in the lives of each other, when we speak to see each other as brothers and sisters and people that are in our family, we're trying to work, when we make a, lot, a difference in the lives of each other, guess what? God hears those footsteps are coming. And then finally we get to this part. If we're one with each other and one with God, then what about ministry to all the world? Verses 19 through 22, the author uses the imagery of a building. Sort of a concrete, pun intended example is this idea of the church that grows. If we are members of a household of God, then the foundation of the prophets and the foundation of the apostles, these are the things that we are built upon. Their teachings, their missionary journeys. But make no mistake about it, Christ is still the cornerstone. Christ is a spiritual dwelling place for us. We begin to build ourselves into a dwelling place for God. And what we begin to know is we think about the word church. When you hear the word church, it denotes a certain kind of architecture, doesn't it? So I serve at Centenary, big Gothic cathedral. You walk in there and it screams God's presence. I walk in this room today. You look around here. It screams God is present. This idea of church, it becomes a sense of place and a purpose. But the purpose is what church is really about. It's what church really does. Because you and I both know that we could have church in the dining hall over here just fine. We don't need the stained glass windows. We need some music. It may not be a piano. It may be a tambourine or a guitar or something like that. But when we're together and the people of God gather, when two or three are gathered in God's name, what? God is present. But see, the church's purpose is what's most key. Ministry of the world. That's why we're here. That's what we're in business with. When I talk to people at Centenary, I talk to any other church, Folks, if you want to know what your mission statement is, you can create all the words you want, but the reality is we are to be in ministry to the world. Plain and simple. We're the hands and feet of Christ outwardly focused. And if the church wants to live into its mission, then it's got to have a lasting impact in changing the world. We must take our connection with God and our connection with each other seriously enough and take it out into the streets. I'm not talking about just mission projects and mission trips. You can go anywhere you want to go. You can feed at the soup kitchen. You can go to foreign countries. You can go and um, help people. You can do projects like a bed and a book or other things you want to do. That's just the first step. But it's not just mission trips. 
It's connecting the church to the world. It's doing things that invites the world into the church experience. And I don't just mean worship. Those of you that are going to go, sorry, how many of you are planning on leaving Divinity School and serving a church? Raise your hands. All right, here's the thing. It's not just a job portfolio. What we do in local church ministry is about connecting the church, what's inviting the church, inviting the community into our walls to experience what we know to find in that place. Those of you that are taking your divinity degrees and are going to go serve in the community, your job is to connect the church from the walls to the streets, to partner with those churches, to figure out how we bring the message of Jesus' love to everyone we meet, no matter how we serve. And then the final thing that we do to connect the church to the world is modeling our faith for the hopes that one day we'll have a conversation with us. So there's a professor here at Wake Forest. She's a member of my church. Um, I'll talk about her later sometime when you ask me who she is. But she's one of these people. She calls me one day. She says, have you got a minute to talk? I said, sure. She goes, so I've never had this happen. Okay, she, te she teaches in the stats department. Now think this through. How many of you know what statistics is? How many of you like math? This is like math with letters and stuff like that that she teaches. She goes, I've never had this happen, but I had one of my coworkers come up to me and said, hey, you're religious, aren't you? I said, what a great question to be asked, right? She goes, yeah, she says, I'd like to learn more about what that means, what your faith is. And she goes, whoa, I went to stat school, not divinity school. What do I do with this? I said, just talk about what church means to you. Talk about what your faith means. But folks, the reason why she asked that she was asked that question was how she lived her life outwardly. It was not because someone was just fishing around going, I'm going to ask all my friends to one of them takes the bait on this. He went to her because of something about the way she squawked, the way she lived her life. Everybody knew in her department that she was a woman of faith. Friends, there is no limit to the good that we can do, to the change that we can make, to the impact that we can have, as long as we desire to connect what we have learned about God's love for us with the world around us. When it manifests itself actually into living into the world. And when we do that, guess what? God will hear you and I coming. So where does that leave us this afternoon? So despite a culture, despite our human nature, despite marketing, despite everything that is done to accentuate the differences between us, we are one people. We are the children of God, plain and simple. The boxes that you and I check in life, they matter to us. But the only box that really matters for the sake of the world and for the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we are children of God, blessed children. And so because of that, because of God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we are one family. And if we are one with God, and if we act as one with each other, and if we are one in ministry all the world, then if we demonstrate the way of peace, the way of love, this nonviolent, more excellent way, like John Lewis challenges us to, if we do that more, then more than freedom will ring, the glory of God shines through in everything that we do. And then we can let the spirit of peace and everlasting love be our guide. And then, and only then, Truly will God hear you and I coming when our time on earth is done. This is a church I want to be a part of. This is a church I want to lead. This is a church I have given my life to. This is a church that I'm constantly asking myself, are you doing enough to build? Friends, I hope you will join me no matter where God calls you from this degree program, from this schooling that you're receiving. I hope you will join me on that. Connect each other connect with God, and connect the church to the world. And if we do that, what a beautiful place it will be. And yes, God hears us coming. Amen, amen. and amen.